Thank you very much. Thank you, China General Chamber of Commerce. Um, we're really happy to be uh, making this presentation to you today. Um, I want to give a few words of introduction, first, if I may, about Littler. Littler is the largest employment law firm in the United States. Um, we have offices throughout the United States and indeed throughout the world. Um, we are very privileged to work with a number of uh, Chinese companies and financial services uh, companies. Um, and so we are very, very happy to be here today. Um, as you might imagine, we have been spending uh, so much time on issues surrounding the coronavirus. Um, and uh, in particular, um, two of my colleagues who are on the presentation today with me are extraordinary uh, lawyers who have um, devoted many, many hours of time uh, to uh, advising employers on all aspects of this, of the pandemic and all employment related issues concerning it. Um, and, uh, and, and we also, uh, well, I also wanna say that we are very thrilled to have with us uh, Alan Wong, who is the Senior Vice President and Head of Human Resources at Bank of China. Um, but I, I will do a little bit more in the way of introductions in a moment. I just wanted to say um, that, you know, um, the COVID-19, um, when it first became an issue, the issues that we were principally dealing with as employment lawyers were, you know, furloughs, layoffs, um, the, uh, the initial round of emergencies involved the fact that companies were going to have to shut down. Um, how did they go about doing that? What were the best strategies for doing that? How could they reduce costs? Unfortunately, of course, as many of you know, um, there were and there continue to be uh, significant layoffs in many industries. On the other hand, uh, many industries such as uh, banks and financial services companies are what are called essential um, businesses and uh, they do not necessarily have to shut down. And so many of those companies um, have continued to, uh, to be in business during this time. But we were dealing with furloughs, we were dealing with issues around the Warren Act. Um, we were also um, unfortunately uh, dealing with things like reducing compensation, um, deferring bonuses and all those related um, matters. Those continue to be a challenge and those continue to be the focus of much of our advice. Um, and along with that, as companies, uh, you know, many companies remained in business, there are and there will continue to be issues uh, dealing with, you know, working from home, not having a traditional workplace to go to. Um, many companies, again, such as banks uh, and other companies deal with highly confidential information, trade secret information, customer information. How do you keep that confidential? There are significant rules and regulations that many of our clients deal with. So how to suddenly can reconfigure so that employees could indeed work from home, have access to uh, confidential um, uh, you know, uh, communications methods, um, and uh, maintain the security and confidentiality of data. Um, and other issues concerning remote work, such as remote supervision. How do we um, properly assess whether someone is doing their job, doing a good job? Um, how do you stay in touch with your, with your employees? How do employees stay in touch with each other? Um, you know, so communicating is a very uh, important part of of uh, remaining open and uh, and continuing to do good work, and of course, um, keeping track of employees' work hours, basic things like that. Um, and so now, though, what we are seeing uh, and what we've been seeing over the last few weeks, and just today, I think I read that New York City is expected to reopen as early as next week, at least some offices, is the issue of return to work. Um, and New York, California, and many other states, uh, New York in particular, um, but have issued uh, extremely comprehensive guidelines for reopening, um, templates for uh, putting together safety plans, um, dealing with issues really that none of us, certainly um, on this scale, have dealt with before. Um, you know, a pandemic, uh, implementing a safety plan, dealing with uh, employees uh, working in that environment. Just yesterday, the NBA, the National Basketball Association, announced protocols for return to work for their players and staff. These protocols are over 100 pages long. 
uh, and they detail everything from what happens in the event of somebody tests positive for COVID-19 to the rules for playing ping pong in players' lounges at team hotels. So some of these plans are extraordinarily comprehensive um, and they require many levels of review uh, before they're implemented. And then once they're implemented, of course, they are going to be subject to second guessing uh, because of the significant risks, um, such as claims of discrimination. Um, how do you screen people out? Uh, the NBA, for its part, is requiring all employees to complete a questionnaire identifying various illnesses they may suffer from and submitting that information to a team of physicians to determine whether they can come back to work. So there are um, many different approaches that different entities are taking. So that brings me to, again, to our panel. We have an amazing panel here today. Devjani Mishra uh, is a, a partner of mine who has uh, worked uh, uh, again, night and day on these issues. She's extraordinary and a no, very knowledgeable. Melissa Peters, uh, also a colleague, is um, uh, a specialist in occupational safety and health. And uh, again, an extraordinary uh, body of knowledge um, and uh, has been extremely helpful to all of us in the firm. And, and she and Devjani are leaders in our co coronavirus task force. Again, we're very happy to have with us Alan Wong and Alan and Cece Chen, who is an assistant vice president in human resources and who may also join us on the line, um, are going to uh, provide information and respond to a series of uh, questions and answers at the end of our presentation uh, on just what it is that Bank of China has been doing um, and how they have approached uh, these challenges. So um, with all that, I'm very happy to turn things over to, uh, to Devjani, who can help us review our agenda for the day and get us started. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks, Phil, for that introduction. Uh, this is Devjani Mishra at uh, Littler in uh, an undisclosed location, as probably many of you are as well. We're all away from our regular offices, but thank you all so much for dialing in to uh, join us today uh, for this session on return to work. And uh, as Phil said, uh, we are going to do a couple of things. Uh, we're going to start out uh, reviewing uh, some of the practical and legal considerations uh, that employers need to think about in setting their return to work strategy. Uh, we'll talk certainly about closure and reopening guidance as Phil referred to, uh, and the importance of designing an appropriate workplace safety plan uh, for returning people to a physical office uh, during a continuing pandemic, um, how to prepare the workplace, how to gear up for return, and then how we re-engage with our workforce that has been dispersed uh, in their own undisclosed locations during this period of time. Uh, and then um, because we do have the benefit of our friend and client, Alan Wong on the phone, uh, Phil and Alan uh, will be talking through um, some of the real world issues that HR and that corporate leadership have encountered uh, in the process of uh, working throughout the pandemic and looking forward to the return to work the return to the physical workplace. And really, you know, it's, it's fine to spend an hour listening to uh, lawyers chatter on, uh, but certainly um, it's, it's always great to get that real world perspective. So um, beginning with the uh, next slide, let's see if we can make this work. Okay. Uh, so, you know, first of all, uh, any of you who are operating in more than one location in the US will have noticed uh, that we have uh, what could charitably be described as sort of a fractured approach to reopening. Um, we have obviously uh, had different experiences of the coronavirus and of the level of the virus in different parts of the country, uh, but we also don't really have a centralized approach to reopening. And so, you know, the first thing you really have to do is for each of your locations, assess the degree to which the state and the locality that you're operating in is actually open. Phil alluded to New York City 
uh, and now it's gradually opening. New York City was, of course, hit hardest uh, really in the country uh, by COVID-19. Um, and so has been on the slowest timeline within New York State for reopening, uh, with really mostly only essential businesses open throughout this period of time. And gradually, uh, on a statewide basis, um, different industries are being allowed to reopen in different regions. We look at New Jersey. New Jersey has yet to issue any uh, reopening guidance. Connecticut is a little bit further ahead, and that's just three states that are close together. Looking across the country to California, where our colleague Melissa practices, uh, California is fragmented down to the county and even the town level in terms of whether it's um, permissible for an employer to bring employees back to the office. Meanwhile, we have other states, uh, Texas, Florida, Georgia, uh, where things are much further along in the reopening process. So you really have to figure out first and foremost, is it even permissible for you to be open? And if so, under what conditions? Uh, you then need to think about site-specific considerations. For those of you who uh, have landlords, have property management, um, you know, there may be restrictions imposed by uh, the building in terms of how many people you can bring back to work, how many people can be in elevators, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, you may have multi-employer cooperation at a site or not in terms of safety protocols because, of course, your employees are going to be exposed to many other employees on the way into your physical office. One thing we're hearing a lot about uh, from our clients and, and talking to our clients about is this issue of regulatory and agency inspections uh, to look at whether people are working safely. Um, it could really be a variety of inspectors who come to see what kind of work is being carried out on site, whether it is the type of work that is allowed to be carried out under the applicable reopening orders, uh, whether work is being conducted safely, and this can come out a number of different ways. Um, you know, under normal circumstances, you might have an agency conducting proactive inspections. At this time, the agencies are fairly busy. So what is most often happening is that uh, either uh, a complaint is called in by someone who's concerned about safety at the site, or uh, you may have a situation where a number of individuals get sick at that site and therefore public health is coming to check on it. Uh, in our experience, we have seen inspections conducted by a variety of agencies. It may be the police, the fire department, the local county sheriff, even the zoning inspector may be pressed into service at this point. So uh, you really need people on site who are prepared to engage with inspectors you know, if they come to uh, review what type of work is being carried out. Uh, you need to be alert, of course, this is 2020, to media and social media coverage. We've seen many, many stories uh, in the media in terms of uh, locations, uh, plants, factories, and otherwise where there have been significant outbreaks of coronavirus and there's concern that unsafe uh, workplaces are contributing to the spread of the virus. And you can expect uh, that uh, this type of information will be shared on the internet you know, either by people who work in those locations or people who are in those communities and concerned about it. Um, and, you know, the other aspect of this that is getting more and more attention this week is that, um, you know, the, the local COVID st statistics vary widely. Uh, New York, again, was hit very hard. Uh, it is thankfully uh, at, at much lower levels of new infections, but we're seeing around the country that over 20 states are actually seeing an uptick in infections. And so what that may mean for you is that while your state and your locality is permitting you to reopen, uh, there may be a very real possibility that if you bring people back to the workplace, that they will be at greater risk of contracting the virus and that you are going to have to contend with that as part of your reopening plan. Uh, we have not quite flattened the curve in all locations. Um, you know, it's something that you need to take into account as you're deciding, do we bring people back? Do we continue having people work remotely for a period of time? We'll talk more about that as well. Um, going to the next slide, um, you know, just some level setting in terms of how we should think about this in general. Uh, something that we say a lot is that the shutdown may have been government ordered, 
uh, but it was not orderly. I don't think uh, any of you on the phone who went through the process of shutting your businesses down would describe how we left the physical workplace as an orderly process, particularly with um, it seemed different orders coming down every day, uh, whether we expected them or not. And as we're seeing on the way back, the return to work orders may not be much better. Um, this is not very orderly. You're allowed to be open here, not there, partially in this county, not at all in another county. All that said, businesses will be expected to do better by their customers, by their employees, by their stakeholders. Um, you know, it really falls to us as employers and those who work with employers to find an orderly way to do this. Uh, that creates some stability and some sense of security for the people who are asking to come back to work. Um, and really, if you look at the pull quote on the side, we need to keep in mind uh, that this, this uh, what we're calling the next normal, is something that's going to be in place for a while. I think many of us embarked on this thinking, you know, well, we're making some changes, but maybe they'll be over in three to four weeks, possibly one to two months. It's clear that until we have a COVID vaccine, uh, there are going to be some very different elements to our workplaces, and we've got to keep that longer time frame in mind. Some of our clients have frankly looked at this and said, you know what, we're not going to come back for a couple of years. Others are doing the best they can to bring people back gradually uh, in this next normal. And so the focus for really any employer looking at bringing people back to the workplace is to build a return plan that is thoughtful and practical that is something that is sustainable for the next 12 or 18 or 24 months. And unfortunately, something that is reversible in the event that you know, the circumstances change and there is either a continuation of this first COVID-19 spike or a second spike or wave uh, you know, until we have more treatments and perhaps a vaccine in place. Um, in terms of, you know, just some legal considerations, uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot on the team working on this within our firm is this idea of not putting on COVID-19 blinders and remembering that there were laws before this and most of them still work. And so as you're bringing furloughed employees back, uh, for those of you who may have furloughed any employees, keep your sound principles in mind. You've got to be thinking about, you know, if you're going to bring back less than everyone that you furloughed. Um, think about what your objective business-based criteria are for the people that you call back if it isn't everyone. Look at things like seniority, look at things like performance based on the documentation you have, and of course, think about the operational needs of the business. Um, because you will be expected, just like before coronavirus, to explain why the people that you're recalling are the ones that you need and you shouldn't be disadvantaging any particular group. Uh, some of you may actually be hiring new employees during this period of time. Uh, again, uh, remember the good principles for legal hiring that were in place prior to coronavirus. Um, if you hire people, you, you will be allowed to screen them post offer for symptoms of COVID-19 and as we'll talk about, you should already have a plan in place to screen employees who are working on site, whether it's through health questionnaires, uh, whether it's temperature checking, or whether you have uh, third parties actually involved. Uh, but that is something that you can do. Uh, and you know, if you have an applicant that you've hired who is tested positive for COVID-19, you should obviously delay the start date for that person. Um, an additional point that bears some emphasis you know, we, we're, we've become very sensitized to the issues of discrimination and workplace bias, particularly at this moment that we're going through um, as a country. Uh, an unfortunate uh, element of the response to the coronavirus uh, in this country has been a surge in hate crimes and bias incidents against Asian Americans all across the United States uh, in terms of misperceptions, and uh, false information about the origin of the virus. And the FBI and the EEOC have flagged this, uh, warning employers to really watch out for mistreatment or harassment of Asians or Asian Americans. The CDC has also cautioned not to let that bias um, infect, uh, so to speak, our safety planning, not to assume any greater risk uh, or uh, uh, or safety risk posed by 
uh, anyone based on their race or country of origin, uh, not to exclude people uh, based on their race or national origin. Uh, and then a different element of this has to do with the issue of who's at higher risk of complications from COVID. Uh, and that is the caution from the EEOC not to discriminate as you're going through your hiring and rehiring decisions uh, based on either age or disability uh, in terms of excluding people that you might hire. Uh, but also being aware that you may have to make accommodations for individuals who would be at higher risk of complications if they contract COVID-19. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who's going to speak more to uh, the real thing that you need to be paying attention to as you're bringing people back to the workplace, uh, which is developing your safety plan. Thanks, Devjani. Um, so I am going to speak to you all about some return to work issues. Um, when we talk about return to work from a safety and health perspective, the key is creating an effective safety program that accounts for and um, shifts with changes in local and state orders, um, as well as CDC guidelines. And as Devjani mentioned, given the prevalence of community spread in New York, um, out of necessity, New York has implemented more conservative return to work orders than other areas of the country. And these orders are going to affect the way that employers are required to return their employees to the workplace. Um, so issues confronting employers in a metropolitan city like New York include not only having to implement measures in the workplace, but also things like how employees are actually going to get to the workplace. Um, so this brings us to our next slide, uh, the issue of getting to the building transportation challenges. So certainly transportation systems uh, will be reducing capacity um, in New York City, the Metro um, Path, Metro North, the, the inner city subway are all going to have requirements to have reduced capacity and this is going to result in transportation issues for a lot of employees. Um, in some locations, this is gonna require adjusting start times or implementing new shifts and or reducing on-site numbers. So we recommend that all employers go ahead and talk to their employee population and figure out what it is that they need in terms of an accommodation, if there are gonna be transportation issues, um, if there is going to be a problem with them getting to work, uh, as an employer, you have to be sensitive to that and understand that people are going to have to adjust the way that they basically do their daily routine. Um, if they were taking the subway to work every day, you're going to have to work with them and figure out a way that, you know, maybe they can still take the subway, but they're going to have to come in an hour earlier or an hour later. And then you're going to have to accommodate them on, on the front or back end by changing uh, the shift. Um, Inside the building, site-specific requirements. Uh, here we're talking about, um, you know, the things that are going to be required once you bring people back to work. And as it relates to the building, if an employer owns or is responsible for the management of the building and the building's been shut down or has reduced operations, the owner or the property manager is going to have to review startup guidance and evaluate the building's mechanical and life safety systems to ensure that the building is ready for startup or increased functioning and occupancy. So you're gonna to have to specifically check for hazards associated with prolonged shutdown or reduced use such as mold growth, rodents, pests, possibly issues with Legionella through the uh, ventilation system. Uh, on the other end, if, if you're a tenant and not responsible for the building operation, it's recommended that you contact the property manager or owner to obtain confirmation in writing uh, from the property manager or owner that they have complied with the guidance from the CDC on reopening and increased operations. And it's going to be the responsibility of probably someone in the human resources department or a manager if you're a really small company and you don't have an HR department to figure out and evaluate which safety controls to implement and whether or not those um, that are implemented are going to be effective. Uh, on to our next slide, workplace reconfiguration. Uh, you're going to have to do a space assessment of the officer work site and figure out what can be done to keep people socially distanced while they are in the office. This means you're going to have to reconfigure the workspace, decommission workstations or desks or cubicles, 
to limit the movement of people and limit the size of gatherings and the use of break rooms and conference rooms. If that can't be done, you're going to have to consider using environmental control options like installations of dividers or other means of physically separating people in order to ensure that they're complying with all sorts of CDC recommended and local guidance on social distancing. Of course, a lot of the social distancing requirements require employees to remain six feet apart. Um, and as a result of this, meetings should be conducted by telephone where possible. If it's not necessary to bring somebody back to the workplace for them to perform their job, it's recommended that they are allowed to continue to work from home. Um, the best way to reduce sort of crowding or capacity issues is to allow those people that can perform their functions to continue to work from home remotely. It's also recommended uh, that you add hand washing sanitizing stations throughout the office and limit the sharing of tools and equipment or common equipment such as uh, copy machines and in the break room things like dishwashers or coffee pots, anything where there's going to be high touch surfaces that people are regularly using throughout the day and not necessarily thinking about cross contamination. There's also things to be done like installing kick touch pedals on restroom doors to, rec to reduce the amount of, of touching on shared surfaces. Things like this can be really effective in protecting employees against exposure to the virus. Other site-specific challenges with effects on, on scheduling that have to be accounted for, um, again, if you're in a high-rise situation, you're gonna have to allow employees to take the time to safely queue and wait for elevators. If only four people are allowed to go up uh, in an elevator and they have to reach the 30th floor, you're going to have to work with your employees and allow them to come in either earlier or later as a result of having to wait in line for the elevator. Uh, again, these are things that can be addressed by staggering shifts um, and having start and stop, stop times to ease congestion. Of course, there's also gonna have challenges about leaving the office for lunch, um, for meetings during the day and also uh, the rush of employees leaving the office at 5 p.m. So uh, those are things that you're going to have to think ahead, talk to employees about, talk to management, talk to HR, and start coming up with some creative solutions to, to address these issues. Um, for those people that are driving to work, they're going to have issues as well based upon whether or not parking garages are reducing occupant capacity. Uh, they may have longer wait times and it's going to take them longer to actually get to their parking spot, get admitted, and then come into the building, wait in line for the elevator, etc. So this is also going to result in an impact on building access or office access by visitors and vendors. So those are things that must be thought about and planned for. Uh, in regard to health screening on-site for workers, many jurisdictions require employers to screen workers. And there are different options that exist. There can be on-site temperature checks or thermal imaging options. There are a lot of um, the thermal cameras that are being used. If that's an option you choose to pursue, we would recommend going with uh, something that only scans the face and not the body because that results in a lot of privacy issues. Uh, there's also the option of having the automatic scanners or having posting somebody at the door who could actually conduct the scanning. Of course, if you do that, then that also raises safety and health issues that need to be considered, including um, making sure that the person that's conducting the temperature screenings is, is wearing the correct personal protective equipment. Um, and at this point, we're really recommending a face covering and a face shield uh, with gloves for that. As long as you have that, that's pretty good exposure control. Um, of course, most jurisdictions are also requiring health screening interviews, questionnaires, employee attestations that are either done through a form questionnaire or perhaps uh, a phone application um, that can be done prior to coming to the office. However you choose to do this is going to be something that should be decided, you know, what is best for your company, how many employees you have. You want to consider things like reducing the amount of people that are standing at entrances to the building. So if it makes sense then to have every employee 
respond in the morning via an app on their phone um, and then just be able to flash the green screen to the security guard when they walk into the building to keep the office flow moving, that's something that you should consider as well. So there are issues with health screening protocols. Um, you know, a lot of times the way these orders are written is quite confusing. I know um, with the language that's used, it's not always clear whether or not the order is requiring that the health checks or the, excuse me, the temperature checks are conducted on site. And if so, is self-screening allowed? Alternately, is it requiring or allowing the employee to do a temperature check at home prior to coming into the office? It's, it's important to constantly check uh, CDC guidelines that are ever changing and of course local guidelines in New York under the, the reopening phases because th this guidance is constantly changing and you want to make sure that you're in compliance with the regulations in uh, the locality where you're located. Um, then there's the issue of paying for time spent waiting to be checked in reporting time. Um, this is something that is, is a critical issue. You don't want to end up not paying employees, hourly employees, for time that they are entitled to um, when they're having their temperature taken. There's also the issue of exclusion of symptomatic employees. How are you going to handle that? You know, there are privacy issues that arise with this. So these are things that you need to think ahead and plan for. Um, is there an area where you can pull the employee to the side in a way and in a manner that's not embarrassing, um, that is not going to make them feel like they are being called out or looked down upon because they have, you know, have not passed either the temperature screen or the health screen. Um, and then, of course, you're also going to have to think ahead in terms of avail availability of time off and how you are going to compensate employees that are sent out as a result of not passing a temperature or health screen or, of course, testing positive for the virus. This brings us to face coverings. Um, as of April 3rd, the CDC is recommending or did recommend that all individuals wear cloth face coverings in public settings um, when it's difficult to maintain that six feet of distance required under social distancing measures. Um, at effective April 17th, 2020, Governor Cuomo ordered that individuals who are over the age of two and able to medically tolerate a face covering are required to wear a mask or cloth face covering when in a public place and unable to maintain the six feet of social distance. For New York businesses that are reopening, all employees are required to wear face covering, coverings in any entry, exit, and common areas of businesses, including, but not limited to, check-in, registration, reception, hallways, bathrooms, break rooms, elevators, time clock areas, and any other place where social distancing cannot be maintained, including perhaps conference rooms um, or even break rooms. There are issues that arise um, when we're talking about requirements for face coverings. Um, you should have a policy in place that addresses these, these issues, uh, that it properly you know, explains how to put on and take off, care for, store, and clean the face covering. Obviously, if you're using disposable, one-use, one-time-use face coverings, that's not necessarily gonna be an issue. You don't have to store them, you can just throw them away. Um, but then the issue with that is making sure as the employer that you have an ample supply of those face coverings to provide to your employees. Um, there's also going to be issues with accommodation for those claiming impairment. Um, any employee should not be wearing a face covering if doing so will adversely affect his or her health. So if an employee requests an accommodation, the company must engage the employee in the interactive process regarding the requested accommodation. Um, the company is allowed to ask questions or request medical documentation to determine whether the employee has a disability as that term is defined by the ADA. Um, and you know, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity or a history of substantially limiting impairment regarding the requested accommodation. Of course, there are also issues with um, employees who have religious dress or grooming requirements or other objections to wearing face masks. So those are things you're gonna have to consider. And there's also accommodations that are required for deaf employees who are going to need to be able to have their mouth visible um, for purposes of, of, of sign language and reading.
So the next thing we're going to talk about is having an exposure control plan. Um, before returning employees to work, it's really important to develop your exposure control plan, including protocols for sending employees home, instituting contact tracing to identify other employees that may have been exposed to a sick or uh, positive individual, uh, cleaning the workplace and record keeping. Um, if an employee is sick or exhibiting CDC symptoms of, of, the, of the illness, it's, it's required and recommended that you send them home for 14 days. Um, if they're confirmed or presumed positive, which means they've received a, a, a clinical diagnosis of the virus, send them home immediately. Then you're going to have to conduct contact tracing. And we recommend that you maintain a contact tracing chart. And what you would do with that is go back to the 48 hours prior to a symptomatic employee um, actually getting tested for the virus and see who they've been in contact with up until the time that they are sent out. If an employee is asymptomatic, you go back 48 hours prior to when they receive their first positive test. You wanna look for anybody that the sick person has been in close contact with for prolonged periods of time and make note of that and keep track of that. Uh, you are required and recommended to go ahead and tell the persons that are determined to have been in close contact with the sick employee that they have been in close contact with the person and to monitor for signs and symptoms. They should also be sent out for a 14 day period to self quarantine and pay attention to whether or not they start to develop symptoms. If they do, they should speak to somebody um, in human resources and report the symptoms um, that they're experiencing and keep a close eye on it and see a healthcare provider. Uh, there's no requirement to tell every employee that there's been an employee who's been diagnosed with COVID-19. However, we recommend that you do go ahead and communicate to all employees when somebody has been deemed C plus or COVID-19 positive. And this is recommended. Um, of course, you cannot reveal the identity of the person who's been diagnosed, but it's recommended just uh, as a measure of good grace and trust to establish trust and faith uh, with your employees and let them know that you're worried about their best interests and always thinking about the health and safety uh, of, of them and their colleagues. So we're going to discuss cleaning the workplace in a little bit further detail in a few minutes. Um, but we would also really quickly just going to go back on this last slide. Oh, sorry about that. Went ahead accidentally. Oh, sorry about that, guys. I don't know, Hallie, if you can go back and get control and put me back two slides, that would be great. If not, I can. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, this is it. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. So the next thing we wanna talk about is developing an exposure control plan um, and being able to handle required reports to health agencies, which is only required in a few jurisdictions. You also need to figure out how to respond to complaints. OSHA has been somewhat active in sending complaint letters to employers. And what you will need to do is you need to respond to OSHA, you need to send a written response, and you need to set forth all of the measures that you have taken um, to protect your employees against exposure to the virus. So it's important to have you know, your protocols and measures in place, as well as things like your contact tracing logs and any other you know, worksite specific checks that you've performed in the event you do get an OSHA complaint and you have to submit all that information as a response to OSHA. Um, Reporting is, is not something that's going to occur frequently in New York. They follow federal guidelines, um, and there's really only a requirement to report um, if, if there's a fatality due to COVID-19 that occurs after 30 days from the workplace incident leading to the illness. Um, similarly, if you have a situation where one of your employees is hospitalized and the hospitalization occurs after 24 hours from the workplace incident leading to the illness, um, you are not required to report. So it, it's something that you should probably confer with the outside counsel about. It's a little bit tricky, but um, it's something that is relatively straightforward when you have a competent attorney who can explain it to you, um, especially uh, under the federal rules in New York. 
So regarding job site cleaning, it's really important um, that break and lunch rooms and other common areas that are not closed off should be cleaned at least once a day. Of course, make sure if you're responsible and employ the persons that are cleaning these areas and um, that they have the appropriate PPE on. So they would need some sort of disposable glove um, and it would be recommended to have perhaps like a face covering just from inhaling the cleaning solution. I mean, if they're cleaning regularly, that can become irritating. So it's good to make sure that they have that as well as if possible, some sort of disposable isolation gown in case they have infected surfaces or splash the cleaning solution on their bodies. This way their clothes aren't going to get damaged or contaminated. It's important that any trash collected from the job site is changed frequently by somebody who's wearing gloves and of course, you know, go ahead and tie off the trash, make sure that the bags are closed. It's a good idea to have closed trash bins in the offices for things like Kleenex, Clorox wipes, used latex gloves, anything like that that could possibly be infected by touching contaminated surfaces. It's better to have those things thrown in a closed receptacle as opposed to an open waste can. Um, frequently touched items like door poles and toilet seats, um, you know, even sink faucet handles. And again, like refrigerator door handles, go ahead and make sure that you're disinfecting those frequently. Um, there's a shortage of cleaning supplies. So make sure you think well in advance of how you're going to handle this. So you're not caught in a situation where you run out of these supplies. Um, and finally, before I turn this back over to my colleague, Divjani, um, we're going to just briefly go through the CDC recommended cleaning protocols. The CDC's changed their position on this uh, regularly since the beginning of the outbreak back in March. And now what they're saying is if it's been less than seven days since the COVID-19 positive individual has been at the work site, what you should do is close off any areas that they've occupied Wait as long as possible, up to 24 hours if you can, to allow for dispersion of the respiratory droplets from the air before conducting cleaning, and then go ahead and clean uh, the work site. If it's been more than seven days since the sick person has been at the work site, additional cleaning is not necessary. However, it's recommended that you go ahead and do a regular clean. Um, of course, any areas where the sick person was, make sure to clean surfaces that they have touched, their office, close out their office, um, and, you know, don't let anybody go inside there. Um, of course, like I said, if you can wait up to 24 hours before cleaning, that's great. The reason behind that is because it allows for dispersion of the respiratory droplets in the air. Um, so there's going to be less of an exposure potential for anybody who's cleaning the area um, going into those spaces. Again, always make sure that the staff has the appropriate personal protective equipment, which is, you know, maybe just a face covering uh, to protect against exposures to cleaning solutions and also prevent them from touching their nose and mouth while they're cleaning, as well as uh, the disposable gloves. Of course, if there's any issues like tears in gloves, rips in masks, um, make sure that the staff or cleaning persons knows that they should report that immediately. Um, and at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Devjani. Devjani, it's all you. Okay. So uh, thanks, Melissa. That was great. And uh, I see that our chat line is pretty quiet because I think people are um, maybe uh, taking lots and lots of notes on everything that Melissa has just covered. Uh, I wanted to turn back for just these last few minutes before we turn it over to Phil and to Alan uh, to talk a little bit about workforce reengagement, which is going to be a large part of what they're talking about as well. And I think one of the most important things that you can do as an employer uh, is to really realize first and foremost that when we think about the return to the workplace, we are not returning to what we left. Uh, we dearly wish that we could return to January, you know, perhaps while keeping the nice warm weather. Uh, but you know, as you can see from everything that Melissa has just said, uh, there's many, many changes that will need to be made to the workplace. Uh, you know, there'll be fewer people who can be there at once. The amount of interaction, uh, casual and informal interaction, 
will be uh, sharply lower. Uh, people will have to be much more conscious of where they are in the workplace and what they're doing and whether they really need to be there. Um, and so it's, it's going to feel very different whenever we're able to get back into our physical workplaces. Um, the other thing that we really encourage and, and talk to our clients about is acknowledging employee sentiment. Um, you know, there is some real concern out there among employees, and it is understandable. Employees are afraid of contracting the virus. Uh, they will have some discomfort about being close to others um, based on, you know, all the social distancing that they've been conditioned to engage in. Uh, there will be some employees who have suffered real losses, who have lasting health consequences, uh, people struggling with financial insecurity, and of course, a tremendous amount of political polarization around the response to the virus. And so it's important to take those things seriously. Uh, we hear questions all the time from employers who say, well, what about employees who are just afraid? And you know, if we're being realistic and honest with ourselves, there are reasons why employees are afraid. And so we have to be respectful about that. Um, it's important to build appropriate feedback channels for your employees, you know, to give people the opportunity as they look at the safety plan um, to perhaps point out things to you that you may not have considered uh, because employees often know very well how they work and where the risks are, what they should be thinking about. Um, you should be prepared uh, to accommodate particular issues that will come up uh, whether it is individuals who have health concerns, uh, folks dealing with childcare, or uh, you know other types of issues that need to be accommodated, you should be prepared to deal with those types of things. And you should also uh, be thinking about, sorry, my slides are advancing a little bit ahead of me. Uh, you should be prepared to communicate transparently with people. One of the things that those of us working on this uh, realized early on is that the law is changing very quickly. The science is changing very quickly. There are simply going to be some things that you won't be able to answer. Uh, and in those situations, um, there can be value sometimes in transparently saying to employees, we've put together this plan. We think it's a good plan. We think it's the best plan that we could come up with, um, but we welcome you to participate with us in making it better and understand that we all have obligations. Um, Along with respect, there is this recognition that remote work for some period of time is going to be part of the next normal, uh, that in some places it is less disruptive to have people continue working where they have been uh, at home or remotely rather than trying to bring everyone back into the workplace and worry about the safety ramifications of that. And that is why you see a lot of financial and tech companies and other companies uh, law firms, for example, that are choosing to make remote work uh, part of this next phase rather than bringing people back to the office as we might have expected in the third quarter. Uh, there is a place for reassessment. Perhaps there are some things that, you know, were not really considered uh, at the outset of this because you thought that maybe remote work would just be a matter of a few weeks or a few months. Uh, so there may be some structures that need to be looked at. And that can include strengthening your remote work policies, you know, training and, and supporting management to supervise people remotely, looking at how your compensation plans work, whether the goals need to be readjusted uh, because 2020 isn't going according to our plans, if we're honest, uh, looking at external drivers of compensation, what our customers are doing, what our clients are doing and how that's going to affect compensation whether there will be uh, functions or locations that are gonna continue to feel effects as travel continues to be compromised, um, and whether there is a need to actually do some more formal restructuring. And um, there's also the issue of re-engagement, and this is something that Phil and Alan will be speaking to as well, uh, but really thinking about you know, your essential workers who never went home, those who worked throughout, and you know, what they may need from you, uh, and also whether there are benefits that you can provide that will better support your employees and your talent in this period of time. It may be childcare uh, for individuals who's, you know, who've been dealing with having kids at home rather than school. 
It may be different elder care options for people who are reevaluating the care of, of elderly relatives. Uh, it may be alternative transportation options uh, because of the public transportation challenges that Melissa mentioned. And again, you know, continuing remote and flexible work. Um, so these are all things that may be part of your planning going forward because working is going to be different for this next period of time. Um, and with that, uh, we will go to Phil and Alan to uh, wrap this all up for us and, and talk about how to stay open safely and how to welcome employees back to the workplace. Okay, can uh, I hope you can hear me out there. Um, uh, it's Phil, and I am going to have the uh, pleasure of, of asking Alan Wong from Bank of China a few questions. I do want to mention that we have received a few um, email uh, or chat questions from attendees, and uh, we'll certainly go to those as well. Um, uh, but I, uh, I'm just having a little trouble manipulating my screen here. But, um, but first, we're going to turn uh, to Alan. And Alan, uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, Alan. Hi. How are you? Okay. Hi. There Sorry we go. Either. Yeah. This is Alan. Okay. Great. Okay, Alan. Um, so, Alan, again, very thank you very much for uh, participating in this uh, event. Um, so, Alan, Bank of China um, has offices in New York, in Chicago, and in Los Angeles, um, and uh, you have, uh, I want to say, roughly a thousand employees. Um, including contractors, maybe a bit more than that. Um, and of course, the bank is an essential industry, which means that it can stay open uh, despite the pandemic. And I'm wondering, how, how is it that you determine, uh, generally speaking, what employees are coming to work or what workers come to work and who stays home? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you again for having me on behalf of the Bank of China. Um, essentially, uh, mo the majority of our employees are actually currently working from home. Uh, they provide with VPN access. Uh, so long as the work can be, can be performed at home, then they will, be, they, they will remain to work from home. For those who need to come in, essentially it's on a needed basis. Uh, they will come in regularly or on a needed basis to attend to matters that they need to perform at the, at the bank's premises. So that's how essentially uh, how we determine who to come into work. Well, so uh, my understanding is that the bank is, of course, a highly regulated um, um, entity, uh, as are all banks. And the general uh, rule of thumb has been uh, for banks um, and other entities where, um, you know, they deal with highly confidential information, customer data, and so forth, that uh, people generally um, don't uh, encourage employees to work from home. Um, were these protocols in place before the pandemic? I mean, were every, did, there, did everyone have access to VPN or was there something rolled out? How did that whole uh, system work? Right, I, I guess traditionally there, there's not a lot of VPN access. Uh, people will be working from home only on a, on a needed basis. Uh, we had a pretty tight control over, uh, you know, VPN issuance, and we have a very tight information security uh, policy in place. But given the pandemic situation, uh, the bank took a relatively short period of time, and we're able to essentially provide almost everyone at the bank with VPN access. But certainly there are a lot of, you know, different guidelines and, and policy and, and, and procedure in place uh, to ensure the confidentiality and the security of data at the bank. So to name a few, the bank has work from home guidelines and uh, human resources work closely with the chief data office, operational risk management department, the uh, information security section, as well as our IT area, which is the America data center in building a, a, a robust, uh, robust uh, environment to ensure that data are secure properly. So what we have done, among other things, is to institute secure and encrypted VPN access. 
employees are told not to discuss confidential customer or send bank information by personal email, text, and any other messaging method. And if an employee has, say, has to conduct a, a conference call, uh, they are instructed to use the bank's secure teleconference line, uh, secure with, with, with a pin. We also institute a tight information security screening protocol for monitoring movements of confidential and sensitive bank data. As far as the HR perspective is concerned, uh, we ensure that the confidentiality of employee as well as candidate information is securely managed by limited access to information and conduct interviews through our secure portal. And last but not at least, the bank has information security policy uh, that does not allow the use of cloud-based tool. So all these are put in place. We have ongoing communication with employee to stress the importance of information security policy of the bank. So, so far, these are, you know, some of the major measures that we have taken to ensure the information security. So in a relatively brief period of time, you were able to go to an environment where we could trust employees to work remotely in a confidential manner and provide them with the appropriate exactly. tools to do so. It's, it's extraordinary. And that certainly has to give uh, you know, the credit to our executive management, work closely with our in, uh, the incident management team and, and achieving that goal at the end in so a very is, short period of time. So this is a team effort, a number of different uh, entities within the organization come together and help to make this happen. Yeah, absolutely. Without the support from executive management, the action implemented by inf the incident management team and, and the department management, we would not be able to achieve that. So let, let's talk though, before we get to, I would, I would like to hear more about the team uh, that you describe and, and how the organization right. has, has done that. But I wanna ask from the HR standpoint, with remote supervision, you've got employees working remotely. You know, I mean, obviously over the years, we've all, uh, we, it's sometimes easier to send an email to the person sitting next to us than it is to turn and talk to them. And so we've, we've come to rely upon electronic communication, even in a normal day-to-day -day work when you're sitting in the office. Um, and so to some degree, I think that there's been an interesting shift in that direction, which has permitted us to work remotely uh, easier. But still, isn't something lost when, when people can't, uh, you know, get up and walk and talk to somebody, you know, n next door, talk to their supervisor, talk to a colleague? And how do you overcome that, um, you know, the challenges uh, that I think may exist with regard to remote supervision in that way? Right. It's a very interesting question. Uh, when you're in the office, you have face-to-face -face contact. Essentially, you know what the person about and you know what kind of work needs to be done. But without seeing the person, you, you sort of felt, you know, you left something out. You don't know whether the job can be accomplished or not. But I, I think the, the interaction by our emails with the access of our look, then you actually see interaction seamlessly uh, connected. Um, you know, interesting part is that, you, you, that employee will no longer spending time on the road commuting. I mean, they're working from home. So essentially, there's no feel of on at the premises and off premises kind of work uh, feeling and, and uh, you know, work hour you could see actually extend, you know, maybe prior to nine and actually way beyond six or 7 p.m., you know, in the evening. So, uh, you know, at the beginning, certainly there is a fine tuning uh, time frame that, that, that people have to get used to not seeing the person work. But I think given time, uh, by seeing the interaction, the seamless interaction, uh, you know, during work hour, even off hour. And I think that, that you know, that change of supervision kind, kind of mentality actually is, is switch and change to a different mode, if you will. Well, so actually, Alan, you just identified an interesting issue, which is keeping track of work hours. So as you said, sure. I mean, I, I get up in the morning and I sometimes log on and I find myself at my computer, you know, bef long before I even would have gotten on the train to come to work. Um, so yeah, I personally have experienced that also working different hours, working maybe longer hours, working earlier, certainly getting an earlier start than usual. Um, and, uh, and sometimes getting on in the evening as well. Um, but how do you, you know, obviously in HR, you know, we have, and in, from a labor law standpoint, point, we have to keep track of workers hours. And particularly if we're dealing with non-exempt employees, 
we need to be sure that we're tracking overtime and so forth. How about dealing with that issue? Well, I guess from the HR standpoint, we actually realize that that's coming. So even at early December, we already paid ourselves uh, by putting together the time uh, keeping mechanism, the protocol in place, and then we start training each department's timekeeper uh, to lock on and track down work hours for exam and non-exam employees. And because of, of the, the platform that we're using, Ceridian is a web-based, so essentially there's really no difference by working in the office and, and logging onto the system to track down employees' attendance time. You know, essentially the information is coming from the department head and also their locking mechanism that the employee has to lock in, you know, via the Ceridian platform. So there is really no, uh, you know, materialistic change to the way how, you know, people lock on and off. So uh, for that, I, I think there is almost a seamless transition when people work from home. And we were able to keep, you know, accurate track of, of all the time spent, at, you know, for work. Well, and you mentioned before that you provided a work from home guidance. I believe you mentioned this before, that you have provided to staff some guidances for working from home. Would tracking Correct. of work hours be a part of that guidance? Well, I mean, among others, th there are parts that talk about the, the work from home, uh, you know, clocking in and out. But I think the regular protocol that we use is already in place and just sufficient enough mm -hmm. to, you know, to have timekeeping guidance in there already. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about uh, just again to just spend another minute on on the idea of remote supervision? What kind of mm -hmm. um, guidance or, I mean, has the issue come up with supervisors? I mean, how do we deal with supervisors and helping them understand the best way to, uh, to, to supervise people remotely? Uh, is this something that is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis or, or would you see this as something that calls for, uh, you know, kind of a broader, broader set of guide, guidelines? Right, but so far we have not encountered you know, some major challenges regarding, you know, the, the supervision of employee as far as the work performance is concerned. I think we have regular protocol in place to basically monitor work performance. So, I mean, it's really just a mind, mindset change of, you know, having people come into the office versus the work from home. So, so far, we have not yet seen any major challenges come about uh, for us to deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, and you mentioned before the teamwork between different departments uh, at the bank, mm -hmm. human resources, you know, data uh, security, information security, IT, and so forth. Um, and you made reference to a team. I mean, it, so did the bank put together a team of, of different people to try to deal with the pandemic and the practical issues? Uh, yes, under the direction of executive management, uh, we we initiate the incidents management team. So it, it's pretty much like a task task force, if you will, um, or you could call it issue management team. Um, I determine, I think what, what it is, is that it's a task force that built uh, to deal with challenges in this time of the pandemic. So it's made up of uh, with, with the, um, the person in charge and, and chair this I, IMT is our chief risk officer. And under that, there is a uh, PMO, project management office, and it's assembled, you know, with different members from different different departments. So uh, we all come together to work basically to uh, identify the situation, analyze it, report to management with the direction coming from instruction from management that will execute it. So it's a very, you know, tightly organized uh, group that work together in dealing with such situation that uh, before it arises, we also you know, come up with different scenario analysis and, and when it comes up that we will be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I want to talk very briefly also about communicating with employees. Um, how mm -hmm. do you keep in touch? How do, uh, when people are working from home, how do they feel, how do you continue to make them feel like they're a part of a community, you know, an organization? What kind of efforts are we making to stay in touch with employees? How frequent do we stay in touch? What are the pro protocols there? Right. Um, there has been ongoing communication to the employees. I, I think uh, essentially we, we, we certainly would have demonstrated um, our, our concern to employee safety and health as a top priority. Uh, there are, you know, from the top, our CEO uh, will issue a newsletter 
um, basically with the assistance of the executive office a media and communication group that work alongside with IMT, IMT group in communicating a high level message to the employees. And there are more messages coming from the IMT group uh, that we also have a communication group from within the IMT, which essentially is made up of a human resources legal office, as well as executive office media and communication group. So we all work together as a team and reviewing the message, make sure that the tone is consistent and make sure that it's legally you know, accurate and, and the tone is well articulated uh, before we communicate to the employees. So uh, th there is this seamless communication to the employees you know, about our, our intent of employee safety and health. And so what about the idea of reopening? I mean, I'm sure that it's premature to talk about bringing everybody back, um, although I know you, you do have some people coming to the office. What is the, what is the overriding message that you want to send to employees? How are you, what is the message that you are trying to send? Well, it's always a challenge to strike a balance between, you know, our, to maintain our, our seamless business operation, you know, as well as employees' health and safety. So uh, I guess the, our overemphasis is that, you know, as employees' health and safety is in top priority, uh, you know, we, we, we will be asking employees to come into work only on a needed basis. And for those who will be able to continue to perform their work at home, uh, we will continue to do so. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's the biggest challenge, but like what we said, you know, this is a new normal and we just have to deal with it. What, what kind of steps has the bank been providing or incentives has the bank been providing to employees who have been coming to work? Has it been, you know, uh, what sorts of things has it been doing for employees who have to get on the train and come in? Well, essentially, uh, we have also put together the consideration of the uh, uh, parking subsidy. If, if people are concerned about, you know, taking subway back to work, uh, they could consider drive, you know, driving back to work. And so long as you retain the receipt, you will be able to get reimbursement. So that's what the, the way of, of ensuring employee safety through commuting. Uh, there is also our lunch room will remain open to provide lunch. Uh, if they work extensive out, there will be complimentary dinner provided. Um, there are, you know, different guidelines in place to make sure to ensure employee safety in the building. So we work closely also with building management and, and ensuring social distancing, uh, seating arrangement that they're, they're apart and away from each other to guarantee safety in, in, in the office. Okay, Alan, that's great. I, I think that this has been uh, extraordinary and I appreciate um, your answers to these questions. And I, I'd like to, are there any last words you wanna say before we, what I'd like to do next actually is maybe uh, turn to some of the questions that we've received from the audience. I'd like to ask Hallie if she can um, unmute the other speakers as well mm -hmm. and, um, uh, but before we do that, Alan, is there anything you want to say? Uh, any last words? Well, I, I thank you again for having us. Um, I, I think the biggest challenge again is, is, the, is the, the fine tuning of our mindset in dealing with more people working from home going forward. Um, and, and these are ongoing challenges and HR will work diligently alongside with executive management as well as department management to, to tackle with these challenges. Okay, great. Okay, so I'd like to actually turn to some of the questions we've received um, and uh, either, um, I guess I would turn to, uh, to Melissa or Devjani. And one of the questions is, um, although temperature checks are not mandatory, um, just got a message from Melissa that their building is having a fire drill in four minutes, so she may have to get <laughs> off. Um, uh, Melissa, um, if uh, temperature checks are not mandatory in New York, but some health screening is mandatory, um, it, do you have any view quickly about the risks of implementing temperature checks versus a health screening questionnaire? Would you recommend one over the other? Hey, Phil. So I, I, I think from an administrative perspective, the health screening is much easier and less of a burden on the employer. 
Um, if you're in a jurisdiction that allows self temperature checks, I think that's fine or allows employees to take temperature checks at home as opposed to on site. Certainly that's going to be relatively hassle free and easy for the employer to deal with. Um, but if it's not required, I would recommend against doing it just because um, and Divjani can add on to this too, because I know she's somewhat of an expert in regards to this ADA and temperature screening privacy issues thing. Um, but it, it raises a lot of issues uh, with retention of the information um, and collection of information as well. So anytime you don't have to do it, I would uh, recommend not doing it. Um, and therefore, I think it's much easier just to do the health sc screening questionnaire route. Yeah, I, I would add to that. They're not equivalent, so it's not one or the other. Um, you know, where symptom screenings are required, temperature is just one symptom. Um, so just doing a temperature check alone is not going to meet the requirement that you're subject to. Uh, but you want to make sure whichever one that you're doing, uh, that you're consistent about it, that you document it as required, and that you address how to pay people for the time it takes. Obviously, the person. Um, who is doing the checks needs to themselves be free of COVID. So there's, there's a lot to think about. Uh, one thing that we're seeing more and more employers do is use uh, a smartphone app uh, in order to document self-screening um, so that people can screen themselves perhaps when they're not at the office because again, the goal is for anybody who has symptoms to stay out of the office in the first place, not bring it to the office. You know, we've gotten a couple of questions about face masks, and I think they're kind of related. And one of them is, um, can an employee, an employer require staff to wear a face mask even if social distancing is in place? And a related question, you know, when you were talking before about um, disability, accommodating a disability, and certain people may not be able to wear masks because it might make them sicker, uh, or they may have trouble breathing, they may have asthma and something like that. What if somebody just says, you know, I, don't, I take issue with all this stuff. It's a free country. I don't want to wear a mask. So I, I, how do we deal with, with that kind of behavior in the workplace? Sure. It's, I mean, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, a lot of what people say about it's a free country uh, or some First Amendment right not to wear a mask. Um, keep in mind that if you're a private employer, you absolutely have the ability to set safety standards for your workplace. And certainly in a number of locations in New York, California, Illinois, Michigan, you know, many of the major states that uh, those of you on the call have offices in, there's actually a requirement for you to have certain safety standards in place. And if you determine that the thing that will keep your employees and your customers and others in the workplace safe is face coverings, you are entitled to uh, make that a safety rule for your site. You may have to make that a safety rule for your site. And you know, if, if someone has a medical reason that they cannot wear a cloth face covering, uh, there is a process to go through to figure out whether some other type of face covering will work. Unlike the early days of this, um, you know, just about everybody seems to have gotten into the face covering business. Uh, I think I get multiple calls uh, per week from businesses. Uh, I also hear about, you know, the, the strangest uh, combinations of relationships where, you know, perhaps a client's uh, executive spouse has gone into the mask making business. So there are many options for securing uh, whether it's cloth face coverings, do-it-yourself options, plastic face shields. Uh, but basically, an employee can't available. just an employee just can't say no. I mean, it yeah. may trigger if somebody is disabled the obligation to engage in a, um, a, a a dialogue with the individual to um, to see if there's something that can be done. But without absent a disability, an employee just can't say no. I'm not going to abide by this stuff. Right, that's correct. And, and if, you know, if someone legitimately cannot wear any form of face covering, and again, there are options of different kinds, but if someone cannot wear any of them, um, then, you know, they may, if they're able to do their job from some other location where they're not around people, then you may want to consider that. Uh, but what you're not obligated to do is let them work in a way that's unsafe to others. Because keep in mind, again, 
the mask isn't to protect the person who is wearing it. It's to protect other people from that person. And what you don't want to do is have a situation where now other employees are saying, you're not keeping me safe because Joe is not wearing a mask. So, you know, the, the answer may be if, if Joe is unable to follow the safety rules and doesn't have the kind of job that can be done from home, then uh, Joe may not be able to do the job. But, um, you know, that's, that is something where you should really look closely at the workspace. If, if you've got an employee that literally works in a place where they can't be separated from people, um, you know, mm -hmm. they, they should be wearing a mask. I think the other part of this question, even if social distancing is in place, um, you know, think about how people work in offices. It's one thing to say like, well, we've, we've drawn a floor plan and everybody is, you know, at least six feet apart when they're sitting still in their seats. Uh, but employees do tend to get up and move around and talk to each other. And you wanna make sure that they have the habit of putting their masks on. If they get up to uh, go to the restroom or the kitchen or to the elevator, they should be wearing their mask mm -hmm. when they're in motion. Mm -hmm. And so that might mean that they should be wearing it, you know, all the time when they're sitting still, if they're not good about remembering to put it back on. And I thank you for that, Deb Johnny. And, and just to take one more question, I'm sorry, Melissa, did you want to say something? Oh, no, I'm good, Phil. I was just making sure I was on mute because the, the fire drill is about to happen. So. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Well, if we miss you, thanks. Thanks for participating. Yes, thank you. Um, but um, I, I just, I do want to just spend, we have a couple minutes. I want to, just to change the subject, we got a question about mandatory leave and employees' time off. And so, Devjani, can you just spend two minutes? I, I know that, you know, companies are struggling, uh, you know, with, um, you know, leaves of absence, vacations, you know, and of course there are new laws that have been implemented in different states providing for leaves of absence if you become sick. Um, is there just a general overview you can give about handling, how companies are generally handling this situation while employees are are working from home or, uh, or, you know, or maybe even on a furlough? Sure. Um, you know, and, and, and to be fair, uh, we didn't have a slide on leaves uh, because we were a little bit worried that if we started talking about leaves, this uh, webinar would have to be four hours long, not an hour and a half. Uh, there have been many, many changes um, to federal law, state law, local law. Uh, we actually got an email that Colorado law has changed while we've been on this webinar today. <laughs> Um, so, you know, even if you had a, a very good leave management team who was aware of the law as of, say, February 29th of this year, uh, you should expect that you are going to need to get up to date on the FFCRA uh, provisions uh, that you're going to need to look at state and local law. And it's very difficult to have one nationwide policy that will accommodate every single paid sick leave law. So you should review that carefully. Um, but one thing to be aware of, because many employers, you know, especially if they furloughed people, allowed employees to take their time off uh, in order to offset the, um, the uh, loss of pay. Uh, so as, a, as a, a gesture towards employees, people are allowed to use up some of their vacation. Keep in mind that you know, the absolute rock solid expectation here is that if you have an employee who is symptomatic for COVID or test positive for COVID, that you will exclude that person from the workplace. And so you want to make sure that there is something available for that person so that they are incentivized to tell you, I have symptoms and I need to stay home. And so that they don't come to work because they think they have to come to work in order to get paid. Uh, the CDC has actually said that paid leave is an element of your safety policy because we want, you know, to make sure that people stay out. So you may need to consider, you know, if you're not subject to the FFCRA, do you need to create some special category of paid leave that employees can use? Um, so that there's no doubt that if they have this virus, they stay home. Um, in terms of, you know, other types of leave, there are a number of leaves in different jurisdictions um, that would apply. Uh, but you, you know, it, it will it will vary according to the types of leave you already have under the policy and, and what people are doing. And keep in mind, 
if working remotely is an option, that's not leave. That right. is working remotely and yeah. people should be paid the normal way for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we are suddenly getting, uh, at, with three minutes <laughs> left or so, we're getting all sorts of questions about paid leave. And uh, I don't want to ask Hallie if we can go another hour. Um, <laughs> and I think we'll lose everybody anyway. But I do think, you know, I mean, first of all, there's a question about whether we can require people to take vacation. And uh, um, even if they're working from home, and of course we can, um, uh, you can, uh, you know, you can certainly require that employees uh, uh, take time off by a certain date, unless as long as your your policy permits that. I mean, if you've uh, if you have a vacation policy, again, they're working, uh, and whether they're at home or they're in their the office, they're they're working. Um, and, um, you know, interestingly, of course, banks are subject to mandatory time off and, and those will still apply as well. Um, and uh, or certain bank uh, employees are. Um, and, I, you know, with the other questions, I'm afraid that with the time we have left, we're not really going to be able to get into detailed answers. Um, Dev Johnny, do you have there's a question about unlimited paid time off. How do we incorporate the FFCRA with an unlimited paid time off policy? And there, that's on, that's on top of it? Or how does that work? Well, that's a good question. I actually, I think we have about seven minutes because um, mm -hmm. we're on until 3.30. Mm -hmm. So let's see how fast we can get through mm -hmm. these. Um, for FFCRA, um, and rem remember, this is the federal law that will apply through the end of the year for companies that have fewer than 500 employees. Um, although there may be other requirements in the states that you're in and this new Colorado law relates to that and basically makes the FFCRA apply to everyone in Colorado regardless of the number of employees. So um, be sure that you know all of the laws that might apply. Um, if you have unlimited paid time off, uh, you will have to figure out how to harmonize that with what the FFCRA provides. And what a lot of employers and, are And what does the do, FFCRA provide again, Devjani, briefly? Sure. The FFCRA provides uh, a limited amount of pay for the first two weeks of leave and a smaller amount for the next uh, 10 weeks, depending on um, the different reasons why leave can be taken. So for the first two weeks, it's ordinarily uh, up to $511 per day. And then for the following 10 weeks, it's up to $200 a day and it's for specified reasons related to COVID. Right. Um, okay. Even if the FFCRA doesn't apply, Though the old FF, the old FMLA, classic FMLA, may apply. Um, so what you may have people doing is using a combination of their unlimited paid time off and their FMLA leave um, to create job protection. But you will want to look at that very carefully um, and at the policy language. Um, in terms of having people use their vacation, make sure that if you're going to change your vacation policy that you actually do that in writing and that it complies with um, state law. There are different state laws, particularly in California, uh, related to, you know, if your vacation policy worked a certain way and people have earned a vacation, um, then, uh, you know, you may not be able to take it away from them without some advance notice and without a written change in policy. So it's an area to tread carefully. Okay, I, I mean, with the five minutes we have left, um, is there anything, Devjani or Melissa or Alan, for that matter, uh, do you have anything um, that you'd like to add before we thank everybody and say goodbye? No, I'm fine on my end. Thank you. Okay, well, listen, we really I couldn't say it then better than that. Thank you very much. Um, we really do appreciate this opportunity. Obviously, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to chat with you. Um, and uh, we hope everybody stays safe and stays well. And thank you again, uh, China General Chamber of Commerce. And thank you to Melissa and Devjani and, and Alan.